Let's lift our Bibles and make this declaration. This is the Bible. It is the Word of God. It's true and I believe it. This book is filled with hope and promise for my life now and for eternity. I'm ready to receive what God has for me from His Word. In Jesus' name, amen. For the last few weeks, we've been, the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the phrase, <clears throat> make every effort. It shows up a variety of places uh, in the New Testament. Uh, we are told by Peter to make every effort to add to our faith. Make every effort, add to your faith. Uh, so there are things that we are responsible for, things that we are to make every effort, put some effort into. Uh, last week we were looking at a couple of places, Hebrews and in, in Romans, where it said make every effort to live at peace. We have a responsibility to be at peace. We talked about forgiveness, issuing it, receiving it, uh, asking for it. Uh, peace. Peace. And today I want us to look at making every effort from Ephesians chapter 4 to keep the unity of the Spirit Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. We are, we are so blessed in this community to have great fellowship with the other congregations in this community. We have great outreaches together. We do the grocery giveaway together. We do High Point Kids Club together. We do baccalaureate together. Those are things that, as as different parts of the body of Christ, <clears throat> we link arms and say, we want to serve our community. We want to reach out to this community and <clears throat> we enjoy great unity in the spirit. <clears throat> but that's not always been the case. It's not always the case in every community. It's not always the case in every congregation. There are congregations where there is east side assembly and there is west side assembly and we'll greet each other over here and we'll greet each other over here but we don't cross the aisle. I think, well, that's sad. That is not the way God intended. He intends us to be together. And another study we did many years ago on a Wednesday night, we, we chased down all the, all the verses in the New Testament that use the phrase one another in reference to believers and how we treat one another, how we relate to one another, what it's like to be in the body of Christ. We are the one another's that the Bible is talking about and how we care for each other. Today we're looking at what it takes to help with unity. Let me read from Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. <clears throat> there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all <clears throat> and through all and in all. Because of God's design for having one body, we have a responsibility to make every effort to keep the unity of the peace. It's God's design. <clears throat> and I have wrestled over the years, from time to time, I've wrestled with this <clears throat> concept of the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. God can do whatever he wants. He is sovereign. He can do what he wills to do. And the idea of sovereignty, God can do what he wants. He doesn't need my help. Well but he invites my participation. He has given us his great and precious promises. We read that from Peter's epistle also. So that we may participate in the divine. We are participants. And so we have responsibility. He is sovereign, yes, but we are responsible to keep the unity of the peace, the uh, unity of the spirit, and the bond of peace, and to make every effort. I don't like it when it sounds like we have to work at it. Shouldn't it just come naturally or even supernaturally? 
And yet that phrase, make every effort, is a statement of, this is going to take some work. So work at it. Because it's worth working for. It is worth it. It is God's design. It doesn't happen just automatically. It's set up so that it will happen if we cooperate, if we participate in the divine, the, the divine nature and do our part. Make every effort. Make every effort. So, I think there are three keys that are given to us before that phrase, make every effort. And they are, be completely humble and gentle and be patient. Make every effort to be humble. Make every effort to be humble. And these almost sound counterintuitive. Because... It, doesn't it take effort to, to build up your reputation and your name and get your... Doesn't it take effort to put your name out there and to not be humble, to, to promote yourself? <clears throat> Make every effort to be humble. First Peter 5 tells us that God gives grace to the humble. Right? God favors those who choose humility. And so... What, is it, what does it take to be humble? Well, it, it takes a great consideration of somebody else. In fact, in, in Philippians, there is a uh, marvelous passage that I think is kind of the definition for humility. Philippians, excuse me, Philippians 2, uh, starting at verse 3. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to back up to verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, there's that idea of unity, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, unity in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. And verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition, or vain conceit, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. So he's talking along the same lines, the same theme, and then this idea of humility, valuing others above myself. Putting myself lower than somebody else. And just looking to them and, all right, I'm going I'm to boost them, I'm going to value them more than myself. That shows up in a variety of ways. It shows up <clears throat> in hospitality. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who pastors downstate uh, put out a reminder to his congregation before Easter. They were, they'd, they'd done this community outreach to invite folks to come to Easter services. And he put out this reminder to, to his congregation. Remember, hospitality says we park in the back, we sit in the front. We give our guests the ease of getting in the door and the comfort of sitting behind somebody else. Park in the back, sit in the front. Now, I say that as a general rule. We have handicapped parking for a reason, right? Those, some of you need to have a close walk, a short walk to the door. By all means, make use of that. Remember when Blonda was still driving? Blonda is, is now uh, 99 years old. Isn't that amazing? So she hasn't been driving for a couple of years. But when she was driving, a few years ago, I mean, she was in her 90s and she was driving to church. She wouldn't park in the handicap. She doesn't have a handicap sticker. She wouldn't park in one. Oh, no, I'll save that for people who need it. Blonda. <laughs> well, she parked, you know, the next tier over. Uh, but, wow, um, I was amazed. Um, parking back, sitting in front. Now, I know it's hard to sit in the front because there's no barrier, right? Well, let me encourage you, move up anyway, move up anyway. Uh, just a word of encouragement. Humble, humble. That's part of hospitality. Humil humility shows itself in, hum in hospitality where we serve others. We serve others. <clears throat> if you go and visit someplace... If you're on vacation, when Lisa and I are on vacation, we visit someplace. We walk in, 
And we kind of take note of how do they deal with visitors? Because I want to learn what can we do better? What can we do better? Uh, and there were times when our, when our kids were little and there's all six of us going in for a service. I remember one time we had to split up because they, they all had their assigned seats, apparently. And there were no six spaces in a row. And, and the two people at this end of the pew and the two people at that end of the pew, neither one of them were willing to move to the next pew either way so that our family could sit together. <clears throat> and I thought, let's not do that to our guests. Oh, we can survive it. We'll be just fine. But let's not do that to our guests. Let's let them sit there. Let's move and make room for, for people and accommodate people. That takes humility. It shows up in hospitality. Of course, some people are over gracious, <clears throat> over generous when you come in. I remember another time we went in and we had two in diapers still. So we're carrying kids and diaper bags and stuff. And we get greeted at the door and given gifts. And we got a mug and a greeter's packet, you know, and, the, and, and I was already overloaded. And I'm not accustomed to being overloaded. That was Lisa's job. <laughs> she did all that stuff. And, but we're on vacation. I have to share the load. And I, and I, I thought, well, let's not do this to people. Let's, let's take care of them and help them. Uh, hospitality, humility shows up in hospitality. Shows up in lots of ways. Um, but it is considering others. Humility shows up in just consideration, just thinking about others. And that's not our natural mode of operation. Our natural mode is we think about ourselves. It's unnatural, or maybe supernatural, to think about others and to put others first. Make an effort to be humble. Make an effort. Make an effort to be gentle. To be gentle. And in order to be gentle, again, you have to consider others. Before I had kids of my own, when there was a newborn in, in any group I was in, oh, and dedicating infants, that was, then I'm expected to hold them. And I was just so nervous about holding a baby because babies are fragile they are regardless of what they say about bouncing baby boys yeah they bounce uh, they are fra- and I was paranoid about holding babies now I'm, I'm better since having my own kids and grandchildren and all that but gentleness you consider the weakness of others you got to support his head you got to <laughs> You don't hold them, don't pick them up like that. You, know, you pull his arms right out of the sockets. You know, you, know, you hear these things, you, you think about their weaknesses. I remember when, <clears throat> when my little brother was born, we were six years apart, and, and I was curious, and I was poking his head, you know, it was, and I was told there's a soft spot, don't poke that. Don't poke that. There's a soft spot up there where the plates haven't fill, filled in yet, and I... Really? Of course, then I wanted... Uh, you, you think about the weaknesses of others. In order to be gentle, you consider their weaknesses. It's easy to see with babies, with infants. It's harder to see in adults. Where, where are their weaknesses? Where are their soft spots? And when you get to know people, then you, you find where their soft spots are. You find what, oh, that was, that was a raw nerve. And it depends on the timing of what events they've recently gone through. To be gentle with somebody is to consider where they're hurting, where their nerves are raw, where their soft spots are, and to be careful, to care for them in those places, in in those regards. Just like you would be careful when you help an injured person. Now I know, now that we have YouTube available to us to entertain us, one of, one of the funniest, painful videos I've seen 
is the medics at soccer games carrying guys off on stretchers. And they trip and fall on top of the guy that they're carrying off, and they just, oh, it is painfully funny. And why is it funny? Because we're sick. Because I'm sick, all right? You're not laughing at it, but I'm I, And you see this guy who's, oh, his leg is, is twisted wrong at the knee, and they throw him on a stretcher, and I don't, I don't know why they're in such a hurry. I guess the clock doesn't stop in soccer, so you just got to get them off the field fast. And these guys go running up there, and they grab them, and they, they aren't gentle. They toss them on there, and then they pick, and they're both facing the same way, and they, so they both turn around, and they drop the guy, and they fall on him, and they, oh, man, it is not the picture of gentleness. It is not considering this guy's in pain. Soccer games. I, I don't know if it's exclusive to soccer games, but that's where I s- saw a whole string of them. <laughs> Make every effort to be gentle. If we were to stop at an accident on the side of the road and somebody was bleeding, hopefully we'd have the wherewithal to call 911 immediately and then offer comfort and, and whatever basic first aid you might be capable of. But you wouldn't reach into the car and go, hey, 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 how are you feeling? No, you would treat them with gentleness. You would approach them with a sort of, oh boy, I don't want to make anything worse here. What can we do to make this better? Uh, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be responsible for this guy not making it here. And so we're going to do what we can, and we're going to be gentle. We're going to care for them. But that takes consideration of their condition. Gentle. And then make every effort to be patient. Patient. Bear with one another. It says bearing with one another in the passage that we read. To bear with one another means to put up with them. They're bugging you. They're irritating you, but you're going to put up with them. To bear with them. They're... They're getting under your skin, but you're going to put up with it. You're bearing with them. To bear with somebody isn't, well, this is a fun afternoon. Let's spend more time together. It's, are we done yet? Can I go yet? I'm putting up with you, but I am ready to punch your face. And uh, it's that feeling of, this is so wrong, but I am not going to let you have it because I'm, I'm going to work through this. And bear with you. <clears throat> I had a roommate in college who, who uh, when we both were mo- deciding to move out of the dorm and get an apartment, he says, Eric, Eric, we should, we should get an apartment together off campus. Well, I knew I wanted to get an apartment, but I didn't know I wanted to get it with him because he took a lot of bearing for me. He just, he just rubbed me wrong in a lot of ways. And we did, he was fun. He was a lot of fun. But I didn't want to be with him all the time. And I'm not so sure I wanted to trust him to pay his part of the rent. And he was fun, but not terribly responsible. And I wasn't so sure I wanted to tie myself in with him in that arrangement. I did. And we had some fun. And it took some bearing to make it happen. Bearing up means it's not easy. It takes effort. They rub you wrong. They get under your skin. But they're part of the body of Christ. A friend of mine reminded me this week of what I said about another friend, mutual friend. He said, I love him like a brother, which means sometimes I want to push him into traffic. Uh, that is the way relationships work sometimes. Yeah, I yeah, love you, but can I just straighten out your teeth right now? I just... Uh, but we bear with one another. We don't straighten them out or, or push them into traffic or we bear with them. The unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, it takes effort. God doesn't put these make every effort phrases in here because it's effortless and easy. It's because it takes work and we are reminded, work at it. Because it's worth it. There is great benefit in working at it. Because if we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, 
then we could celebrate one body, one spirit, just as we were called to one hope. We're not at odds with people. We are striving for the same goals. We're aiming for the same destination. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. I started by saying how grateful I am for the unity of the Spirit in the body of Christ here in Ascoda. I'm so grateful to serve with other pastors on the same page. And when I go out of town, I can call one of them and say, hey, if anybody from my congregation is in the hospital, would you be able to pay them a visit? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. And, and we cover for each other. And when we get together, we enjoy being together. And when we have concerns, we pray for one another. And when we <laughs> happen to run into each other on the street, we don't cross the street to avoid each other. We enjoy running into each other and having time together. And not just pastor to pastor, but congregation to congregation. It's just wonderful to have that kind of unity. We are not at odds with another part of the body of Christ. Is everybody exactly the same as we are? No. And that is by design. We are unique. We are individuals. And individual congregations have unique personalities. We have various traditions and, and practices. But we agree on an awful lot of the same stuff. And we differ on very little. I'm in a Bible study at the high school on Thursday mornings uh, with a bunch of the uh, men out there. And, and we come from a variety of traditions. Uh, the book we're studying right now is, uh, is called 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. <laughs> 30, get that title. 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. Uh, the school year is 36 weeks. We won't quite finish it. Uh, but we've been having some great discussion. We've been having a great time of fellowship. And even though we come from different traditions, we believe that there is one Lord and Savior. There is one baptism, one spirit, one body of Christ. And it's great to be together. Be patient putting up with others, bearing with one another, be gentle, we're considerate of others in their weak spots, we're humble, we think about others and put them before ourselves. These are the things. And when we do that, we can celebrate each other and be part of the body together. It is not God's design or desire that we are all cookie-cutter exact likenesses in the body of Christ. He has made us with great variety on purpose. Because the world is filled with great variety. And we are to reach the world. The Bible says that in heaven, every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be represented in heaven. All kinds of people are going to be there. Because all kinds of people reach them. So let us make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. In our society today, if the church demonstrates to the world what the unity of the body of Christ looks like, I have to think people are so disgusted with the division in the world that they will swarm to the church to to find out what it feels like to be part of something that is unified and not divided. And when people in the community from outside the church talk about, well, if the body is so, if the, if the church is so united, how come there are so many different congregations? Well, we have different traditions. And there have been times when there was a reason to part paths. Right? Uh, several years ago, we had a pastor in town who <laughs> didn't believe that this was the final rule for what we believe and how we behave. And I called him on it. I said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't go against this. Well, you know, if you're going to pick out a few obscure verses in the Old Testament, I said, well, those verses that you're referring to also are 
referred to and mentioned in the New Testament, that whole concept is followed through and it's, it is not just an Old Testament obscurity. It is a theme in the scriptures. And, you know, the, the issue that we had, he wanted to dismiss as, oh, Old Testament obscurity. He said, it's still the Bible. It's still true. And it's affirmed and confirmed in the New Testament. So I called him on not believing the Bible. And we didn't have unity. We weren't on the same page. I know there are times when we disfellowship. We part from the unbeliever. We're told in the New Testament, if they reject the truth, treat them as you would a sinner or a tax collector. Somebody who needs to be saved. Somebody who needs to receive the grace. And so there are times for that. I'm grateful now we're on the same page in this community. And, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, so much so that, and I know, in the Catholic Church there are some practices and some things that I don't understand or appreciate. But Father Charlie, here at Sacred Heart, he and I are on the same page. We, we both value Scripture in the same way. We both have a very similar perspective on reaching the lost and bringing them into the kingdom. There's great unity. A couple of years ago when, when uh, we finished uh, baccalaureate and, uh, and he knew I was going to be conducting a funeral for a teenager who had recently died in a car accident, tragic you know, drinking and driving accident, um, he, he made a point of coming over to me one-on-one -on -one and put his hand on my shoulder and said, Eric, I'm praying for you. Because teen funerals are pretty tough. And I'm asking the Spirit of God to give you words and wisdom to say it. And man, he was in my corner. He was pulling for me because he wanted to reach the community with the good news of Jesus Christ. And he knew that this would be a critical time. And he just wanted to make sure that I was under God's anointing when I went in. I thought, I did not expect that from the Catholic priest. And that was one of the breakthrough moments for me of realizing we really are on the same page. There really is a bond of peace between us and the unity of the Spirit. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. So let us work at it. It takes effort. It's not effortless. It takes work. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Because God blesses the unity of the body of Christ. God blesses us when we strive for, when we work at unity. So what's your assignment this week? Where have you been at odds with somebody? Or somebody been at odds with you? Because it doesn't matter which side of the bridge is burnt. Either side can work at rebuilding it. Let's work at rebuilding it. Humility. Gentleness. Patience, patience. King James says long-suffering or forbearance. Long-suffering. Let's work at it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being the God who is with us, who is for us, who has a great plan and design for us. And your design is that we be united. United under the banner of the cross. United in the spirit of the living God. Thank you, Lord, for the family of God, for the fellowship that we enjoy and can enjoy, even though it takes work. It's not automatic. Help us, Lord, to work at it. Give us the wisdom and the energy to work at it and to make the effort so that you are honored and glorified, so that the world will see that God is at work in us, that you are real and you are good. You are the living God who changes lives. We need your help, Lord. And while we're in an attitude of prayer, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if this morning you're here and you'd say, well, I haven't begun my, my journey 
in faith. So I really haven't been part of the family of God to feel united with it yet. But I'd like to. I want to be part of this. I want to be in the family of God and know the hand of God, the gracious hand of God upon my life. If that's you and that's your desire, the steps are pretty straightforward. Say, Lord, I've been on the outside looking in and I want to be on the inside. I have been doing my own thing and I, I want to know your guidance in my life. Lord, I am asking you to forgive me because I know I've messed up, I've done wrong. But if you will forgive me, and you've promised you would, if you will forgive me, I will receive your grace and I will walk in your ways and I will strive to know you more and to grow in faith and knowledge of you, to add to my faith, and to work towards unity, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And if that's you, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you just prayed something like that, if you agreed with me in that prayer and it's a first step for you, would you raise your hand and look my way? I want to be praying for you this week because you're in for an adventure. New things are starting for you as you say yes to Jesus, leading you in your life. For each of us, Lord, <clears throat> we're grateful that you have said yes to us and given us the invitation so that we can say yes to you. You took the first action, and now we follow up and we continue to say yes every day. We need your help. Spirit of God, we know that you have come to help us every day, all the time, not just on Sunday mornings, but all through the week, especially when things are more challenging. We give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's stand together, shall we? Romans 15, 13, when I pause, you fill in the missing words. May the God of fill you with all and as you trust in him so that you may with hope by the power of it is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Let us overflow because the world needs that kind of overflow. God bless. Have a great day. And once again, happy Mother's Day, ladies.